Okay. Can you see this? See the screen. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, um, I'm going to come back to talking about projects in Africa because I'm specifically concerned with water as an issue. Um, and of course, um, in my professional experience since leaving Sterling Wilford when Jim, Jim Sterling died, um, I um, was left in a, with, a, with a predicament on my, uh, in my mind, which was that I had been involved with a number of competition projects in the office in London, where, uh, which were, some of which were sponsored by large Japanese construction companies. And we had spent as much as a Porsche on a model for a competition that we didn't win. Um, and I found that rather strange and, um, and, and troubling. Uh, and when I came to America in 1996 to teach at Yale, um, I was left with a certain amount of anxiety about what it meant to uh, spend so much time and so much money um, addressing uh, uh, questions which really were for the very smallest number of people in the world. And I, um, I have a particular fascination uh, and was taught by a number of members uh, of Team 10 um, uh, who, who were at a conference in Aix-en-Provence in 1952-53 um, uh, at which the issue of architecture for the greater number was the, was the defining topic. And it seems to me that that is still, in my mind at least, the defining principle in relation to the practice of architecture and how uh, uh, as a discipline and as a profession, we might think about how we best serve uh, society in the largest sense. So architecture and, and in principle habitat for the greater number uh, remains with me as a, as, as a kind of founding principle. One where the architects who I respect who were at that meeting of Siam, who then broke off to become Team 10, um, that they were compelled to address questions which had a profound impact at all levels of society, not just for the most privileged. And, um, and, and, and tied into uh, that uh, position in relation to architecture is from my point of view, um, a profound skepticism about the uh, persistent uh, uh, accelerated increase of the importance of architecture as as a constituent element of what Guy Debord would have called the, spec the society of the spectacle. I am primarily concerned with work which is anti-spectacular um, and which addresses the needs of the maximum number of people in the most profound and basic way. Um, but um, I thought that I would start today um, with, as I said um, in my rather in kind of st strange and informal introduction of myself, uh, with a passage from Vitruvius, uh, book two, chapter one. Um, I discovered when I was working with, with water and with ecological challenges of the most severe kind in parts of the world where uh, people have very little money and very little access to services and certainly to infrastructures uh, that we might expect to be um, a, a human right. In many parts of the world, they are not. And I'm interested in work in that area. Um, but I tend to go back to the beginning of architectural history, let's say um, maybe not more than 5,000 years, but at least back to Vitruvius, because I found that in relation to the organization of space and the intelligent use of resources, that it was very often true that the earliest examples uh, were remained um, compelling and important to this day. And so I liked the idea of starting today with a, with a, pass a short passage on the origin of the dwelling house about fire as the center of, an, uh, uh, of, of a conversation uh, in order to situate what I'm about to talk about in relation to fire, air, and water. And so um, um, Vitruvius says this, the men of old were born like wild beasts in woods, caves, and groves, and lived on savage fare. At that time, as time went on, the thickly crowded trees in a certain place tossed by storms and winds and rubbing their branches against one another caught fire. And so the inhabitants of the place were put to flight. 
being terrified by the furious flame. After it subsided, they drew near and observing that they were very comfortable standing in the warmth of the fire, they put on logs and while thus keeping it alive, brought other people to it, showing them by signs how much comfort they got from it. In that gathering, at a time when the utterance of sound was purely individual, from daily habits, they fixed upon articulate words, just as these had happened to come. Then, from indicating by name things in common use, the result was in this chance way they began to talk and thus originated conversation with one another. Now, um, uh, I, maybe you've had um, David Gibson talk um, within the studio in so, at some time. Um, his book on uh, eco nature is, uh, includes uh, that passage. Um, and it seems to me that that's, it's a very important passage because it starts with the forest fire and it ends with the conversation. And in a sense, what I believe is at stake here is to start with the forest fire uh, and to continue uh, with the conversation. Um, while I was working um, in East Africa, um, I um, um, went to a number of conferences. I'll show the project in a little while. Um, in Nairobi, in Kenya, um, the predicament with building the building uh, was that the budget was so low that it was impossible to pay for travel. The only way to pay for travel was to go to a conference and use the conference to pay for the travel to go and uh, supervise the site in person. And I went to one in particular, which made me profoundly aware of some of the predicaments and also some of the ways in which uh, global uh, 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 communities address the question of smoke and fire in, in um, in their own way in, and, and in a way that has some impact on the way that I then thought about it in relation to the work that I was doing. And I wrote a short piece um, for a magazine um, in um, Argentina um, uh, on, a, on the question, of, on a geopolitical question, but one where air and fire were clearly constituent parts of it from my point of view. And if I can read that short text, um, that will get me started and get me relaxed enough to be able to talk you, <laughs> to you a little bit more. Um, and I, I call it In the Air Tonight. Um, and it goes like this. China is hosting the Asia-Pacific Economic Corporation Summit in Beijing, six years after the manufactured clear skies of the Olympic Games, another climate engineering operation has become necessary. Factories are being shut down, traffic density is radically reduced, and for 72 hours or so, the notorious Beijing air will be clean enough that the leaders of 20 nations attending the summit may not have to endure that particularly strange sensation in the nose and the back of the throat, or irritation in the eyes that would be customary on any other day. Everybody loves the smell of blue sky in the morning. Apex blue, as it is being referred to in the media and on the streets, is an effect, the consequence of a cover-up which covers nothing, a perfect exercise in transparency executed with a clarity that simply reinforces the notion that we know what we know and we know what we don't know, and we know that we, what we don't want to know but do, it is obvious to everyone. I reflect only three weeks ago, it was, I was in another great polluted city on another continent. I'd flown from New York through London T5. It was a quick trip for the conference of African scientists, science journalists, and policymakers in Nairobi, Kenya. The international airport was packed with people in a hurry. There were warning signs about Ebola on every column. I was made very aware of the tension in East Africa and the anxiety about containment that was widespread. I passed through immigration as quickly as possible, paid $50 for a visa and cleared customs. Nothing to declare, of course. I was met outside by a friend, an environmental journalist. We walked to the car. I loaded my luggage into the trunk, including a large bag of clothes and various items of value bought from America that he and his relatives had bought online. It was late. The traffic was okay, but Nairobi at night is very dark. 
I didn't know where I was going, so I had to trust. The best roads are new and have been built by Chinese contractors with Chinese labor. The roads we were on were not. The journey took about 45 minutes. Finally, we arrived at my hotel, the setting for the conference. The security guards at the gate checked the car for hidden explosives. We entered, it was late. The sleepy attendant at the front desk checked me in. I was not really paying attention, but in the half light of night, I slowly realized that all the signs were in Mandarin. Entering, entering my recently repainted double room, I dropped my bag and sat down on the bed. On the shelf in front of me, there were two brightly colored tins. Each tin contained a gas mask. I would like to let that sit a little bit because for me it was, and it may not be a moving experience for, all, for, for, for everyone here in this room, uh, but for me it was very strange to go through the night in East Africa and arrive at a hotel um, and uh, which was clearly a hotel for uh, the contractors who were building the roads that I had um, be, would be driving on the next day. Uh, and in that hotel, uh, precautions had been taken to deal with the everyday occurrence of fire and excessive smoke in the building um, as a matter of course, in a way that in other buildings in the same city that, um, that, that it would have been unimaginable. I was struck yesterday as I flew from Ohio to uh, Charlottesville, Virginia through Charlotte, North Carolina, that in the airport, there was an announcement before I got on my plane uh, that yesterday was Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent in the uh, Christian calendar. Uh, people were walking around the airport with ash crosses on their foreheads. Um, and an announcement just before I got on the plane said that a service was about to begin and that ash would be available. It reminded me that in um, part three of T.S. Eliot's uh, poem, The Wasteland, um, that there is um, a persistent theme to, to, to concerned with, with burning, burning of a kind which is a sort of a form of redemption, burning as um, a way of, uh, of, of, uh, of or, or, or rather the burning up of desire as, as a preoccupation, as something to be uh, considered. And in the middle of that poem, in, uh, in, in, in the third part, in the fourth stanza, it's the, the opening line is unreal city under the brown fog of a winter moon, and that that city is London. But then I realized reading The Wasteland this morning, having been in Charlotte last night, um, that um, that in a sense, London is a fire city planned by Christopher Wren after the Great Fire of London. Paris, another city that I've lived in quite extensively, is a fire city replanned by the Baron Hausmann um, in order to, uh, to address um, the architecture and, engin and, and engineering considerations that might relate to many things, but one in particular being the consequences of, of, of planning for safety in relation to fire, I realized that every city I had lived in, um, other than Los Angeles, um, had an architecture which was specifically concerned with mitigate, mitigating against the spread of smoke and flame. Our, our party walls that stand up above the parapet line, above the roof line, the careful management of flues, um, the way that, that buildings are stacked and organized um, and where things go wrong and have gone wrong in a profoundly tragic way in the recent past, it's because the infrastructure itself works like a furnace, which was true uh, in London um, uh, within uh, the last decade before, well before the pandemic, um, that, um, that fire, a great purging, belching fire uh, was, uh, was, a, was an everyday experience in some parts of the underground infrastructure of the city. Um, but I, and I was thinking that, you know, what is it that we do that positions, uh, that makes it important for us to think about, uh, uh, to think about what architecture might mean and might do in relation to the predicament that is, which is embodied um, in the element fire and in its um, primary uh, symptom, smoke. 
Um, and as I said uh, earlier on, I was taught by people from Team 10, notably at the University of Bath, uh, by Peter Smithson, um, a wonderful architect from uh, 20th century architect, um, uh, who um, built, um, he, Alison and Peter Smithson built a, 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 a project in the city of London called the Economist Building, um, and, and, and were specifically concerned with the orchestration of soot and the marks uh, made by the great smokes uh, uh, of the great smoke of the city of London um, in the time before clean air legislation. I'd considered the possibility of showing a photograph today of a moth that changed its color uh, after the introduction of the Clean Air Act, that the moth was so good at camouflaging its presence and that it had turned a sooty black color um, and after the Clean Air Act, there was a direct relationship between the introduction of new legislation and the colouring of the moth. And I think that that, for me, um, is, um, is a, um, something worth thinking about in relation to uh, the challenges that you uh, all face in relation to uh, the architecture of the city um, in relation to uh, the present ecological predicament. And, um, uh, I, will, I will send Carlo my notes so that I don't have to read everything, um, but um, and because I want to prioritize now um, the work that I've been doing on water as an, a kind of in a way as a, um, an example of how to deal with one specific predicament environmentally and also what that might mean in, in, in broader societal terms. Um, but at the end of, of, of this afternoon, I want to leave you with um, a manifesto that was written in 1978 by an art critic in Paris who lived in this building. Um, and his name was Pierre Restagny. Uh, he wrote very beautifully about the work uh, of the artist Eve Klein, who uh, as well as inventing a new color, blue, international kind, Klein blue, which is not quite ultramarine, um, also was preoccupied with flames as an instrument uh, for, for, with which he could work. And with the color at the center of the flame, which Restani uh, describes as the void, the blue at the center of a flame um, being um, a, a profoundly spiritual place. Restani lived in this building that I photographed um, at the end of last year. Um, and uh, uh, in 1978, he had taken a trip on the Amazon, on the Rio Negro, actually a tributary leading into the Amazon um, with uh, the artist Franz Kratchberg. Uh, Kratchberg lives in Amazonia and he works with, um, with, with the forest and with the forest fires. Um, Mike Davis, in his piece in the LA Times in 1993, talked about this, and I will uh, get to that in a second, um, about, about the, 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 the dilemma uh, that Los Angeles faces as soon as um, privileged people build in what he calls an ecology of fire. Um, Kratchberg and Restani um, um, in this building, um, uh, Restani uh, rewrote the, the manifesto, and when I walked past, I uh, reflected about my first time reading it um, and, uh, and wrote this. I cannot remember when I read Pierre Restani's Manifesto du Rio Negro for the first time or where, but I know that on Sunday, February the 21st, a few days before leaving Paris to travel to Edinburgh after visiting the Cemetière de du Montparnasse where he is buried, I decided to visit the building he lived in. For how long, I do not know. Last night, after reading excerpts from his Neo Rio Negro journal, July to August, 1978, I read his last review, Magic of the Amazon, published posthumously on July the 8th, 2003 in Domus. You can find it if you look for it. I'll send the notes. He died in May. I will never forget his words, like the forest, mental oxygen. Um, and um, I, 
uh, I really like the idea that um, in thinking about the relationship between forests and cities under the conditions that your studio is looking at them, um, that one might think of the forest itself as mental oxygen. Um, and in Rest on E's words, an integral expression of planetary consciousness. I then, in my composition of fragments, I work in Istanbul periodically um, and um, have been walking in the footsteps of, of the young Le Corbusier, um, who at the age of 24 uh, in 1911 uh, went to Constantinople. Um, and and, and he, when he arrived, and this is the Galata Tower uh, in my photograph, um, there was, uh, soon after his arrival, a great fire, which was in, uh, incredibly traumatic for him. Um, I am not going to do what I originally thought I'd do, which was to read uh, a long passage from Le Corbusier. But what I will do is, again, Carlo, if that's okay, send it to you so that people can have uh, some uh, a, a miniature library of research material uh, from, from this uh, uh, occasion. Um, and, um, and when I come to LA and see you all, um, I'll bring some things with me as well. Um, but um, for, for Le Corbusier, the, 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 uh, who would go uh, to a cafe with his friend um, and think about what it was to, to, um, to, to, to um, how he might think about the architectural consequences of having experienced this traumatic event where all the Ottoman houses in one particular area were burnt down to the ground in one night. And the only buildings that remained uh, clear and pristine um, as the smoke cleared were the mosques. And um, he wrote incredibly beautifully uh, about it. And I would like, if you haven't read um, Voyage uh, to the East uh, already, I would urge you to read the passage on the fire in Constantinople as one that is really profoundly important in relation to how Le Corbusier thought about architecture in the future and how, um, and also um, how he experienced it as a young architect who was probably of a similar age to a significant number of you. Um, in my text about this uh, experience, sit in his footsteps, um, I had a dream. It is 1911. I am in Constantinople drinking boza, eating Leb -le -le Levi in the Vefa Bozazitsky, close to the Sulemania Mosque, eavesdropping on, on a conversation between two people, traveling companions, perhaps, talking about their voyage d'Orient, where they have been, where they are going. They are excited. One is an architect. Maybe his friend is too, I cannot decide. I can see his face reflected in the full width horizontal mirror on the wall opposite the corner counter. He's around 24 years old, serious, Swiss. He has an accent. I hear that he's been working in an office, a very good one, that is doing a lot of work for an important company in Berlin, AEG. He has plans. He is determined. He will be famous, like Sinan. They laugh. I sat in the corner watching the man at the cash register. He took off his watch and wound it up very carefully, checking the sound of the mechanism with every rotation, cleaning the glass face before putting the watch back on his wrist, tightening the well-worn leather strap, fixing the clasp and sliding the surplus through its retainer. Time passes slowly. And I, um, my experience moving to California again after such a long time in this is to, um, since that first visit in 1988 and walking along the beach um, has been to reflect on what it means to be in that slowness of time passing and that the urgency of the present and the ecological and uh, uh, political and uh, uh, predicaments that we are all dealing with, particularly today and over the last few days, um, struggling to come to terms with what it means 
um, from the banalities of gasoline prices uh, skyrocketing to uh, the uh, awful uh, realization that uh, we have friends um, who are uh, uh, running for their lives, um, that as I walk along the beach, rather like T.S. Eliot um, in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, um, I listen to the sea in the ideal present, in the mystic now, um, to think about what it means uh, to, to be in situations which are so transitive. And, and as a preamble, I would say that that, um, I hope, as a kind of reflection on what it might mean to these days with the challenges that we all face to practice, it seems to me that it is important to, and I'm certainly at my age, I'm learning how to be, remain, how to remain in the present um, and not uh, be lost in either the past, despite my interest in archeology span and art history um, uh, or um, uh, excessively concerned about the future. Um, that we are, as somebody like Tim Morton might state, um, living in end times, um, but that doesn't mean that there is nothing that we can do. And as Hitoshi uh, so uh, nicely said, when I said I didn't really know why I was doing this today, um, said that what is important is that we talk about what we have done and what we might be doing in relation to the uh, predicaments that we face. I want to show you uh, uh, a project, one project, one project that deals David, with... David, you are not sharing the image right now. I am. Okay, here you are. So... Um, So one predicament, you have many to deal with. Um, and um, the Rio Negro Manifesto that I will send with my package uh, from written by Pierre Restani, Restani in the Amazon um, talks about what it means to be an artist uh, confronting um, ecological uh, crises of a kind which are to him as a city dweller from Paris, being in the Amazon rainforest for the first time, um, utterly overwhelming. And his admiration for the artist Kratchberg is extreme. Um, and it changes um, Restani's mind about what it means to make work. And he coins the term uh, in uh, integral naturalism as a response to the predicaments that he sees in the 70s. One of the things that really puzzles me about architecture um, is how um, issues uh, arise and then are systematically neglected. Uh, when, G when Georgi Kepes um, uh, was uh, curated the uh, 1970s Sao Paulo uh, Biennale um, on the theme of uh, the rising ecological consciousness, um, not only was that uh, exhibition closed early, um, but the discourse that surrounded it and emerged from it um, lasted for a, a very short time and is only now beginning to res resurface again, which is astonishing. I, when I was faced with the, the a, a decision leaving Sterling Wilford after Jim Sterling died uh, as to what to do um, and having paid uh, my team's paid uh, so much money for architect an architectural model uh, in a competition that we did not win. Um, uh, I thought that I would refocus uh, on uh, uh, another question and one that might um, have some traction and we might be able to think about how as architects we might do something uh, to address one of the most straightforward and fundamental issues faced by the world. Um, and that is actually not water, it is girls' education. 
that in the parts of the uh, African continent where I chose to work, um, there were uh, uh, women and girls, uh, girls in particular, would not go to school because they were walking for water. And yet every NGO um, working in the water, uh, access to water area, who was concerned with providing safe water to communities, advocated drilling into the ground, uh, borehole wells um, into fossil water in aquifers that were very deep, uh, depleting those aquif aquifers, um, and in many cases, uh, being uh, the wells being dry within, uh, within a year, or toxic. Um, or broken, without the resources locally to fix the problem um, with uh, water that is heavily fluoridated or uh, has high concentrations of arsenic, um, or water that's simply um, dangerous uh, to drink. Um, and um, in fact, according to the World Health Organization, uh, nearly five years ago now, 60% of the borehole wells drilled on the African continent by well-meaning uh, NGOs uh, are broken within one year. And in Mali, it was 90%. Um, so why is this interesting? And why is it interesting in relation to architecture? Um, um, this uh, recycling bin uh, represents the amount of water consumed by a European in a year. And this is an American, typically Amer an American consumption of water in one year. And this um, is the amount of water um, in the communities that I work with uh, that are consumed by an entire family uh, in a day. Um, sorry, did I say in a year with a, the, these are daily water consumption and that's daily water consumption for a family um, in uh, a rural part of, of Kenya. And so I was left with uh, a predicament, how to think about making a practice that was based on, um, which, would, which, which was profoundly concerned with, with architecture and design, uh, but would nevertheless um, uh, um, work uh, in circumstances where it should, could be and should be catalytic. Um, and one of, one of the parts of my practice, which I believe is important is that I have spent a lot of time in the last three decades telling stories and using stories that are very simple uh, to communicate with the largest possible audience. And one of those stories is a story called The Stone Soup. Um, which um, is a, a, a well-known uh, children's story. It's been written in many languages. Uh, I think every language in the, uh, in the world has a version of this uh, story. Uh, in Poland, there's, a version, there's another version called the nail soup. Um, and in parts of India, there's a variant, which is the stone curry. In fact, there is a prize in the United States for, uh, for uh, uh, work with um, a, an explicit social purpose, which is called the Curry Stone Prize. And um, for this, for, uh, purely as a, a consequence of the story uh, and the people involved, but um, the story uh, is the defining master signifier. Uh, the principle with the in, the in the story is, is that after uh, a situation which is, has been catastrophic in some way, a war, um, environmental disaster, um, typically a war, um, then um, there is, a, the, the, the story takes place in a small village, um, somewhere remote, where everybody who's in that village has become scared. They certainly do not trust foreigners. It's important to me as a foreigner working in situations uh, that, uh, where my presence, particularly as a British, uh, white, uh, British man of a certain age, uh, puts me into a position where I am quite likely uh, to be uh, uh, to be regarded with suspicion, um, particularly in post-colonial situations, or uh, and in Kenya in particular, where the British administration had been brutal. Um, and um, 
the, 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 the story goes on, which is that the small group of people who've been involved in some kind of conflict um, walk over a hill always down into a valley towards the village, arrive in the village, everybody who lives there has, has hidden in their house. Um, they shut the doors, they shut the shutters, um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the sound is of complete silence. Into that silence, uh, this group of strangers arrives and they build a fire and they set up um, a pot. One of them is a cook. Uh, the pot's filled with water um, and uh, the water starts to bubble away and steam. And the uh, cook looks at his uh, friends and uh, says, um, I need you to go off and look for a soup stone. And um, when I've given this, uh, told this story with large groups of school kids, uh, we act it out and they go off and look for things uh, like soup stones and we bring them back and talk about which one would be the best one to make a soup. And of course, there's always one. In this case, it was my young daughter um, who is holding a stone that has been painted fluorescent green um, but in, the, in any version of the story, it could be any particularly good, good fragrant uh, stone which will make a good soup. And that stone is chosen and it's put into the water. When that part of the story is reached, it is always the case that the youngest, smallest, bravest person in the village opens the door a crack of the house that they live in and looks out and walks across to the person who is the cook and says, what are you doing? And the cook says, I'm making a stone soup. The stone soup um, and the, uh, the child says, um, oh, is there anything that you would need? To... And the cook says, well, actually an onion would make it a lot better. And that small child goes back and they said, find an onion and they bring it back. And so the story goes on that slowly everybody in the village um, has come out to look to see what's happening and everybody has gone back and found something to go into the soup. So ultimately the soup is a, a representation of the village itself. Um, and, um, and typically um, there is enough soup uh, to feed everybody, everyone gets together in the same way that the fire in Vitruvia's story is an agent of conversation. Um, in this case, the stone soup is as well, except that the stone itself is inert, flavorless, lumpy, and, um, and its sole purpose is catalytic. And it seems to me that it would be um, necessary, obligatory in fact, to think about a way in which architecture could make soup, soup, soup stones and that those stones, whatever they happen to be, uh, would be catalytic. At the time, my partner and I were invited to by the Copenhagen International Theatre and the um, uh, uh, Danish Architecture Centre to go to Copenhagen for a Biennale uh, to uh, work in the city um, in 2007. This is a long time ago, um, and um, and to 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 we um, didn't know what to do. Um, it was the Biennale was called the Metropolis Biennale, um, but we looked to see what was happening in the city, and at the same time, this event was taking place: the Homeless World Cup, um, a four-a-side street soccer tournament of teams of formerly homeless people, uh, drug addicted people, uh, any uh, number of, of, of reasons why these people were exceptional in their recovery and commitment to soccer, to football, um, uh, traveling over the world to come and play. Uh, and uh, my partner and I sat in the stadium. We signed up to be members of the press for the uh, homeless World Cup and used materials from that for our piece in the Biennale. Um, and we made a calculation um, of the water capture capacity of the street soccer tournament venue if it were conceived as a watershed. And 
what was surprising was that in Copenhagen, um, and indeed in many parts of, of, of sub-equatorial Africa, a street soccer tournament venue of the kind that we were standing in would harvest in excess of a million liters of water per year. We took the report to the Annenberg Foundation in Los Angeles, presented it to them, and they funded uh, two years of research, uh, culminating in the construction of a full-size model, this is the model, in the port of LA um, of a rainwater harvesting street soccer tournament venue. Um, to use the topography of the stands um, and the catchment surface of the playing of the pitch, um, the field, um, as uh, an artificial watershed and to capture enough water uh, to provide fresh, clean water, filtered water uh, for a significant sized community um, uh, somewhere at that stage, we did not know where um, on the African continent. This photograph, um, well, actually two photographs. This one was taken by Fox News um, and another was taken by um, uh, an LA Times camera uh, a photographer who was is just behind the goal on the right-hand side of the image. Those two photographs went viral. Um, and a few months later, uh, we received a call uh, from a foundation in East Africa, in Kenya, uh, saying, uh, would we be interested in thinking through how to um, go to the next level and actually build something, not necessarily this, in that situation. And that initiated, the grant initiated um, a period of, of research which led to uh, a project which we called water banks. Re-examining re the fundamentals um, found in Vitruvius, um, but also within common sense about what it takes to capture enough water, store it, and then clean it uh, to provide a drinking water supply uh, for uh, a, a, a small community. The fundamentals being a catchment hood, a basin, a tank, uh, and filters on the way in and out. We tried different versions of this, um, and, um, and then with, even with the simplest, smallest uh, containers, 20-foot uh, shipping containers, two in uh, joined together with a, a 60 by 60-foot 60 hood, uh, would provide enough water for uh, two people in palms in the desert in Palm Springs, California, uh, and in Kenya and Nigeria and Haiti, uh, considerably uh, more. And so it seemed very straightforward that this is something that needed to be um, to be worked on further. And we had grandiose ideas. We thought we had money from LA. We were based in Princeton, New Jersey. We had a project in Haiti, um, and we hoped that it might be possible. Uh, to build three demonstration rainwater harvesting sites uh, on the African continent. One of the critical issues, though, was to work out how uh, to uh, filter the water. Um, and so our, um, and the, our research uh, uh, suggested that the best solution was um, an open source design um, for a water filtration bucket uh, which was made with a combination of clay and sawdust, which was then fired, um, producing a bucket of this kind, um, which has a complex wall. Uh, and the more complex the wall structure, is, the better, um, because the architecture um, of the bucket that filters the water has to work at a scale uh, represented by this diagram, where the large circle is the cross section of a human hair. And the small dot is the particle size that has to be taken out of the water. Um, the, the, the key discovery uh, was that this simple bucket, water filtration bucket, uh, could be organized in series. So rather than being a single point of use uh, filtration unit, it could actually be scaled to the point where it was uh, suitable for use in a school community. So we worked at three scales from this point of use uh, filtration unit to the uh, small uh, catchment basin uh, to the street soccer uh, tournament venue. Um, to produce um, an artificial watershed uh, with its um, with water flows 
from the sky, from groundwater, uh, a catchment basin, filtration units, um, and then uh, water uh, for irrigation, for cooking, um, and uh, for, uh, for drinking uh, as a result. Built prototypes. This is our steel worker in uh, Lucian Peebles in, in Princeton, New Jersey, um, working very uh, intuitively with uh, frameworks that need, could be assembled without drawings where the assembly protocols didn't matter too much uh, with a board of advisors, including this extraordinary man, Wole Sabayejo, who was a professor of, of, me of mechanical engineering at Princeton. Um, and went on to become the president of the African University of Science and Technology in Abuja, Nigeria, where I worked for a year. Um, and this is the first prototype serially organized water filtration system uh, built um, at the School of Architecture in Princeton, um, and then ultimately implemented um, in uh, rural Kenya. We filed patents. Um, the main reason for filing a patent um, and um, I actually own three, um, is that patent documentation, the process uh, demands that, that the patent office supply the inventor with every invention that has ever been considered in the same field. And so, and that, that, that your work is then scrutinized by uh, a patent review process which is the most rigorous peer review process I've ever been through in my life. Um, and, um, and, and absolutely uh, extraordinary, uh, but one that, that, um, that, that means that whatever is invented is actually an invention rather than simply uh, another iteration on an idea that existed before. And so um, uh, we have patents uh, for uh, sports pitch rainwater harvesting systems suitable for use in developing countries and for modular water filtration uh, units. Uh, also one for a deployable wind term, turbine for use in disaster recovery scenarios, um, which, um, which was a strange one to push through the patent review process because the turbine itself isn't novel. The container it's in isn't novel. The only thing that's novel is the way that the mast deploys and the device that's used for deploying it. And so that, that one took much longer to, to uh, work through. And then the video I showed you at the beginning was of the children in a school um, outside Nanyuki in the center of Kenya, which has a unique situation which became very, very important, which was that, um, there's no water, uh, uh, roads which for much of the year were uh, unusable, um, very few schools, very poor uh, gender uh, e equality issues because of tribal communities, um, uh, tra traditional preoccupations and that girls often would not go to school after the age of 14, would be married um, or, or worse. Um, and um, abused, um, uh, but the strangest thing was very uh, significant bandwidth uh, supplied by safari tour operators working with a telecommunications company in Nairobi um, and also uh, satellite communication. And so it became possible to conceive of a situation where it might be uh, possible to make a, build, make a building for 50,000 US dollars at a cost of $8 a square foot with four classrooms, gardens protected by a perimeter wall, good cross ventilation, um, teachers' offices, water filtration units, um, and, and common areas um, and a system in the center that had 150,000 liters of water capacity. And, to, and so the challenge that we were given was that a, not a, a, a foundation 
had a grant of 38,000 euros, $50,000 US at the time, to build uh, a school, which would typically build four classrooms in a row um, without any, um, uh, without a system, without water tanks, uh, and without uh, any uh, common areas, and certainly without an expanded program, including food uh, and water. Um, and, and to start it, there was a, a, an event here where the tank is under construction in the center of the, this image and um, 250 people from all the surrounding villages came to help dig the foundations. I, um, uh, I was a professor at the Cooper Union for 15 years. And when I did tours of the building, I'd always take people into the, found, in, into the foundations of the foundation building in New York City in the East Village and in the foundations of the building, uh, there is an auditorium and in that auditorium, the Great Hall, uh, that was where Abraham Lincoln gave his famous anti-slavery speech and also where every um, uh, major political uh, figure, um, certainly democratic politician uh, since uh, uh, Lincoln's speech and when uh, Obama was a Senator from Illinois and uh, wanted to confront Wall Street um, it was done at the Cooper Union in the Great Hall in the foundations of the foundation building. There is something profound about a community getting together to make the foundations for a school uh, to which their children will uh, be uh, going. And so it was after a lot of time and also uh, a co very complex and intricate process um, involving um, minimal uh, site visits because of the budget, but a round trip ticket, including ground, ground transportation and accommodation to that part of Kenya from the United States would have been $5,000 or 10% of, the, contract, of the, the construction cost for the entire project. So obviously it was necessary to find other ways um, of uh, supervising uh, work on site. Um, and um, I used Facebook Messenger because um, it became clear that in the community, everybody knew somebody at some distance from their family, but who had a smartphone or a computer that they would use after church on a Sunday. And so it was possible to pass low resolution photographs and even small video clips back and forth between the people working on the site um, and the Eastern Seaboard of the United States on a Sunday evening um, in order to mark up the images um, and send them back uh, to people who did not read drawings, but could build. And, um, and so there's a whole story about how to build in those situations, which I um, have been thinking about a lot more recently, which is like how to, how it's done and how, and, uh, and this is a very, very simple building, as you can see, built with very, very rudimentary means. $8 a square foot um, is very little money. Um, and um, I imagine that the desks that you're sitting at uh, probably cost more than that uh, to fabricate. Um, the building is, uh, uh, stone and concrete and that small project uh, was named by the USGBC and World Green Building Council as the greenest school on earth uh, in uh, 2014. Um, the greenest school on earth because the people from the World Green Building Council wanted to show that it was possible to think about resilience and sustainability um, in a way that did not insist on lead innovation credits or BRIAM standards being met um, or any other um, uh, protocols uh, being followed, but, would, but was rather simply the exercise of common sense in favor of building for the smallest amount of money to produce uh, a place uh, that would uh, for the greater number of people. 
And um, and I, for me, that goes back to that conference in Aix-en-Provence in the 50s. And the, the architects from around the world after the Second World War um, who de decided that architecture for the greater number uh, should be their priority. Um, not spectacular, not extraordinary, um, but remarkable in other ways um, in relation to the way that it serves um, uh, the needs of people in the most challenging situations. And so after um, uh, winning the greenest school on earth, we were then asked to do another. This one's a secondary school. And the ambition has gone up, obviously. And for the first time, it is now possible to work with larger numbers of people building um, and also to build a reservoir for one and a half million liters of water underneath a sports uh, field, but also, but still to build in a way which is ancient. Um, every element of the construct that is recycled and reused, every piece of timber um, carefully uh, stored and reused, moved on to the next building, uh, or becomes part of the construction uh, of the place itself. Um, and the the atmosphere on the site was as, as, as building construction has been probably for millennia, uh, very crude, slow, and, um, um, and using uh, minimum means. Here I am um, doing what is necessary in these situations, which is explaining the project to the politicians. Um, and next to me is a man who uh, would soon become the Minister of Water uh, for um, the region. Um, and I'm talking to him about how uh, the buildings work, but also about the weather and, and how to identify uh, particular conditions of you know, when the rains are coming and so on. Um, and um, that led to the completion of sm a small campus of buildings a dormitory for girls in the foreground for 100 girls uh, to protect, which is uh, to protect them um, and uh, sanitation facil uh, facilities for them, boys dormitories um, and the uh, playing surface and sports field uh, with eight new classrooms uh, and offices for a, uh, uh, a football uh, soccer uh, league in the region which is used by uh, the communities at large and also many of the nonprofits in the area uh, as a way of supporting education programs, nutrition programs and other things. And a small building uh, which produces food uh, for 600 people every day uh, on the right. Uh, and with pipe work in the ground fed by the, the large tank underneath the playing surface uh, with the capacity to irrigate um, uh, uh, multiple five acre parcels uh, uh, in conservation agriculture. The dormitory, the latrines, and matron's house, the dining building, a tree planting program that went with this construction process. And here, the most important part the, the system underneath the playing surface, which holds the water for the surrounding region. We couldn't build this building for $8 a square foot, but it was built for $15 a square foot um, and prefabricated in Nairobi and then brought in um, uh, and then um, adjusted locally. Every surface organized to capture water with big gutters in the ground and uh, water runoff on, um, into sluices uh, in the, the gaps between the stands. And, uh, and to persist with the educational mission of the project, um, this is my friend, Diana Sierra, uh, doing uh, menstrual hygiene classes with girls from the school who are going to live uh, in the dormitory. Um, and what was move, profoundly moving about the experience of doing this uh, was that um, 
these girls who are from family wearing their Sunday best uh, from families who live on uh, less than a dollar a day um, uh, were asked to write on a piece of paper what they wanted to become as they became adults. And they all wanted to be doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers, architects, uh, people who would make a difference in the uh, community. Um, and um, at this point, I normally tell a story about the golden egg, which is about the folly of believing in gifts. But I'm going to leave that aside for now. Um, because it's, it's quarter to six where I am, so it's quarter to three where you are, I suppose, and, um, and show you this image, which is at the end, the building opened with two and a half thousand people coming to play uh, football, soccer, um, and um, at a place uh, where the logic of girls going to get water rather than go to school had been replaced by uh, uh, by something else, which is that the school itself became the source of water. And so the school and the well and the river and the watershed coincide uh, at a place which is also um, a meeting place for uh, people from all over the region. Um, I would like to leave that there, if that's all right. And, um, and so, um, the slightly strange talk because it tried to bridge two uh, areas, um, but I um, I hope that that worked in some way. Thank you, David. Um, guys, I mean, sorry for this complicated technological issue. Hopefully, yes, I didn't we didn't spoil your talk, but uh, thank you. Is there any questions? I don't know how we can ask for even question. Huh? Oh, come here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I, oh, you, 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 okay. So I have to kind of give this seat. <laughs> yes, that's good. Have a question, okay? That's very good. Hey, David. Hello. Um, this is a super inspiring talk, and I'm I'm really excited by these projects. I'm wondering how um, how successful the buildings have been in catching and filtering water, and if basically what the process is to come back around to these projects and and check on them and and how they're being yes. cleaned. Yeah, well, I think that's clearly that's a big issue, and um, I mean one of the challenges working with community-based organizations is uh, with very low budgets is actually make, trying to make sure uh, that things are managed um, in that way what's happened since with these two projects is that they have become uh, government schools so they've become in a way public schools they weren't in the first place they were they were they were developed by community-based organizations working together with with um, landowners um, in a complex situation where um, local activists were very frustrated, particularly in this part of Kenya. And I'm now working in Ghana where the situation is rather different. Um, where um, the, the, the accusation is that the landowners, um, either uh, Euro white Europeans or uh, more recently uh, politicians from the Kikuyu tribe, um, who've taken large areas of land in the post uh, took in the in the post-colonial period, um, then do what the local people call the equivalent of throwing cookies over the fence, which is that fifty thousand US is not really enough to address a challenging need for uh, buildings for education, and certainly doesn't allow for local organisations to follow up. Um, and check that things are working. Now, I, um, when I went to that conference that I read the short passage out about, about the clean air and about the gas masks in the hotel, 
and the Chinese contractors and Chinese hotel operators who were taking a significant amount of, uh, of, of taking a lot of responsibility for the best, uh, the best work that's done with infrastructure in that, in that country um, with some political trade-offs, uh, obviously. Um, but the, the, that conference allowed me to take a team of journalists and science scientists to uh, the schools uh, to look at them uh, one year after, after they had been complete. Um, and I have personally been back once since then, um, but are also um, in contact with people who worked on the site, uh, worked at, uh, work at the schools and who work in the community um, through social media, uh, where they, uh, so we maintain contact through social media in the same way that I use Facebook Messenger to do some of the supervision work when it wasn't possible to go to the site to exchange photographs and mark up and make notes and talk to people using relatively low bandwidth chat um, made it and continues to make it possible to know enough about what's happening uh, to, to measure uh, the su success or otherwise. Now, there's a story that I want to tell, which is important, and, and it's very great that you raise this post-occupancy evaluation issue as a question, um, it, which is that um, I did go once unannounced on my own on a Saturday to the small school, which had been named the greenest school on earth, and clearly, um, as you could tell, if you were looking closely, has got all sorts of problems with the construction because of the way it was built with the experience that was used, etc. And I went to see whether some of the issues that I thought were going to happen happened, which they did, which is where, where there was movement. The soil is incredibly bad. It's black cotton um, and black cotton soil moves a lot, when it, when, well, particularly when it rains. It becomes like a thick clay soup and then when it dries, cracks. And when it cracks, anything that's spanning across the crack will tend to have hairline cracks in it. And I went there to do a little project with, with a, another community-based organization for building a toilet um, or a series of toilets, latrines, um, and went to look. And when I went into the courtyard, um, there was a group of, of kids from the local village who were pumping the tanks dry into um, small um, 500 liter uh, polypropylene tanks and loading them up into um, somebody's truck uh, to take the water away. And what I discovered from the science journalist who I was working with in Nairobi was that the water was being sold. And so it was being caught, captured and pumped out and sold. Um, now, whether that was being sold to make money for the school community to hire people or not, I don't know. Um, and I was very troubled by this. And I said to him, his name's Wycliffe Muga. Um, I said, what do, you, what do you think? And he said, um, I wouldn't worry about it. He said, regard it as a success. Because what it meant was that in the incredibly complicated and peculiar economy of aid that operates in rural communities in, in, in East Africa, in fact, all over the African continent and elsewhere in the world, that people know that a gift is not a gift. And that's why I typically end with the golden egg story, which is that, which is that the gift of the building with the tank of water um, was only a gift insofar as it was a machine that could be used and it could be used well or it could be used badly or it could not be used at all. And, and, and I've thought about this a lot about how much agency we can have in doing anything other than making sure that the circumstances that we build are in a sense fit for purpose how much impact we can have on the systems of governance which are organized locally that maintain and manage those machines 
um, is another question. And I think when I talked in Mohammed Sharif's class, um, I ended with um, an, a, a couple of slides and an anecdote about a meeting I'd been to in Ghana, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, where I'd been to a village called Katape in the rainforest outside Kumasi. Kumasi has some of the most extraordinary buildings because um, it's the, uh, at the Kwame Nkrumah, Nkrumah uh, University of Science and Technology. They have buildings built by Fry and Maxwell. Um, yes, yes. And, and, and all the people who worked for Le Corbusier, Dennis Lazd, and all sorts of people built these astonishing buildings in, 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 in Ghana, in central Ghana. Um, and yet in the rainforest, there are, there, are, there are villages of people who've been displaced uh, by landowners or by bad weather or whatever from other parts of the country who are growing coffee beans, cocoa beans, um, in the undergrowth and in the, in the understory of the forest and then harvesting those beans. Those areas have terrible situation with, with um, surface water runoff and soil erosion and nowhere to store water. And so I'm doing a project there. But I ended my talk to Mohammed's class um, with, with the experience of what it was like to be in the meeting of scientists and government officials um, and other consultants. And, and, the, and, and the, in a way, the tragedy that we never know to, uh, to be the long-winded answer to your question is that I know, but I don't know. And I also, one thing I do know is that it worked and it worked well enough that the water could be sold and then replaced by an NGO with a tanker of water and then topped up by the rain and then pumped out and sold again and the whole cycle continued. But I also know that the metrics of capture to storage to, to draw off and the, the, the kind of the mechanics of it work. The governance of it is, an op is, is another question. Right. Okay. And that that is true even at, in central government in major cities that there are um, um, incredible challenges um, and that we do the best that we can. Now, um, uh, the other thing I did last time was I talked about Colin Rowe's essay on good intentions, uh, which is where um, it's easy to enter into a very kind of sticky uh, conversation, particularly in relation to architecture and, and, and architectural history, uh, which is about, you know, you know, what does it mean um, and, and um, to have the intention that something should happen um, and then to find that it does or it doesn't. And is it actually wise to base an architectural practice on good intentions? And I think that too is an open question. But what I know for myself is that it's very important to do it. Definitely. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that problem, it, it's, 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 um, now I, I'm, there's the, the Mike Davis piece in the LA Times from 1993, which I'm going to send, which you, you may have read already. It's like, why do rich people build in fire ecologies? Um, and it's a, it's full, like as you'd expect from Mike Davis, it it, it is, it's riddled with resentment, mm. but at the same time, it it explains a very clear, you know, political truth in relation to those that have power, uh, and those that don't, um, in relation to the ecosystems that supply cities with, with nutrients and water and all sorts of other things, and are protected. Uh, and that cities are formally protected by gently managed ecosystems, ecologies of fire based on burning, the necessity of burning in order to maintain the forest well, to ensure the germination of seeds, to, 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 to make sure that the next year's growth is healthy and to remove parasites and other things from the understory, that in the drive to build on the land um, that a new class of arsonist um, is invented um, that's called the, um, the entitled uh, wealthy property owner. 
um, which is Mike Davis's argument, which is that which is that the the the, the problem is not an environmental problem; it's a, a political and economic problem. Now, what we all know, of course, now now if we didn't know it then, is that it's both. Right. And but the, but those situations pertain everywhere in the world, even in the rural communities that I work in, which right. is where you know within a within a um, half a mile of the site uh, are probably some of the wealthiest Europeans on the planet. And if they don't own the land, they're going on holiday. And so it's 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 as they say, it's complicated. Right, the wicked problems, right? <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. Well, exactly. thank you for thank you for your talk and thanks for answering.